Hi, I'm Andrew Falzone, and welcome to Simply Science. I'm filling in for Barry Mitchell, who's off this month. Today, we're at CUNY's Advanced Science Research Center. First up, winter is almost over, and pretty soon we'll be setting our clocks ahead one hour. But did you know that daylight savings time could be bad for your health? Here's Susan Jun. To most of us, moving our clocks forward or backward twice a year seems like a harmless matter of routine. However, studies suggest that daylight savings may have some serious impacts on our health. The initial effect of having to shift your clock by one hour causes sleep deprivation, and that sleep deprivation is associated with increases in stroke, heart attack, auto fatalities, work accidents, even an increase in, in suicide among men. But how can one hour make that much of a difference? I met with Dr. Ori Schaefer, a professor in the Neuroscience Initiative at the CUNY Advanced Science Research Center, to find out. Professor Schaefer studies the brain of the fruit fly, which is similar to the human brain when it comes to circadian rhythm, which simply put is the brain's 24-hour clock that controls the body's sleep cycle. Ancestrally, what our internal clock does every single day is to try to set itself to sun time. Springing forward to daylight savings time does not change sun time. Our clocks continue to try to synchronize to, to the daily cycles in the solar irradiance. So that doesn't change, yet we're asking this biological system to, in one day, shift its, its internal rhythm by one hour. And that one hour for many is subtracted from an already sleep-deprived system. If you imagine how life has changed for human beings, even since 1950, when only half of the country was electrified, we now spend much more of our time inside, which means we get drastically less light during the day, and we have devices that are constantly lighting up right, our eyes and our brain at times when we should be experiencing darkness. Take away another hour of sleep and the effects of daylight savings become painfully clear. A 1999 John Hopkins and Stanford University study found over a 21 year period, an increase in car crash deaths on the day after moving clocks forward to daylight saving time. In 2014, a study at the University of Michigan found the loss of an hour of sleep during daylight savings increased the risk of having a heart attack by 24% the day after springing forward. Other studies have found that the negative effects of daylight savings can be subtle as well, impacting a person's mood and diet. So the natural question is, why do we practice daylight savings? In the winter months, it gets dark quite early in the evening, late afternoon. The idea was by extending the day, the short day, into the afternoon and evening hours, uh, we would consume less on candles and other energy. An idea that was proven false over time. These days, people justify daylight savings as a way to address short daylight hours in the winter months. Daylight savings time is designed to give us light in the evening. But we know in great detail that light delivered in the morning is the best light for keeping us synchronized, strongly synchronized to local time. And in fact, light at night makes things worse. Light at night will actually delay the clock. In an effort to stop the clock, many scientists are opposing an upcoming bill trying to lock New York State time to daylight savings time. We're all trying to reach out to our uh, representatives um, to make sure that they're informed about uh, what will really clearly be the negative implications of locking the clock to daylight savings time. Only time will tell. For Simply Science, I'm Susan Jun. Like Dr. Schaefer's fruit flies, we often look to other members of the animal kingdom to learn more about ourselves, even if they're some of the ugliest animals you've ever seen. I recently headed off to the College of Staten Island to examine some of these wrinkly creatures and to see what scientific secrets they might be hiding. This is a naked mole rat, but don't let this critter fool you. It's lying right through its big buck teeth. That's because it's not really naked, it's not really a mole, and it's not really a rat. 
Dr. Dan McCloskey sets the record straight. Their modern day relatives are animals like guinea pigs and also porcupines. And so, yeah, they're, even though they're called mole rats, they're really not that related to typical rats. They're actually quite different. So are they really naked? They do have hair. They're not quite naked. Um, it turns out that they have these small sort of uh, bristly hairs all over their body. Um, these hairs are actually whiskers, so they're using them to sense their environment. In the wild, naked mole rats live in underground burrows connected by tunnels. Researchers like Dr. McCloskey believe those tiny hairs help them find direction and airflow while underground. These critters live in a matriarchal society where the queen reproduces with a select few breeding males and with a face that only a mother could love. It's a good thing that the queen mom is blind like all of her loyal subjects in her colony and about those big Big front fangs? So they have these four major incisors sort of on the front of their snout. These are teeth. They use them for digging. It's um, remarkable that they can move them independently like chopsticks and that they can keep their lips closed and yet dig through tunnels uh, for hours on end. You know, their teeth are really remarkable in their, in their ability to, to move dirt. Um, but also, uh, they, they use their teeth to sense things. So by using them sort of like feelers, they can, if they encounter something, maybe in a dark dirt tunnel, they can figure out what it is by, by feeling the texture of it. But what these grotesque ground dwellers lack in outer beauty, they make up for in their hidden genetic gems that could help save human lives. People are really considering them superheroes of science that they're teaching us a lot about resistance to certain things like cancer and longevity and, and, and uh, old age. Um, and so they, it's interesting that they've sort of They've changed the rules in many ways about what it means to be a rodent and a mammal, and this is, the, you know, maybe it's through mutation like X-Men or something. One of those superpowers is that naked mole rats can survive for periods of time without oxygen. Another super skill is the ability to function in high carbon dioxide environments. Scientists believe their underground CO2 rich environment helps slow the aging process in the naked mole rat brain and could help us better understand neurological diseases in humans. There are also genetic mutations in naked mole rats that could help with research in epilepsy, autism, and schizophrenia. Jenna Pat Hanaflet is a master's student and gives tours of the lab, explaining to visitors the importance of the lab's research and getting them to overcome the naked mole rat's ugly exterior. Some people come in and they're like, oh, I didn't expect them to look like that. Uh, and some people are like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. That might also be because naked mole rats are the world's only cold-blooded mammal. What also makes them cool is that they share more gene families in common with humans than mice or rats. Spending so much time with them, Jenna also sees their softer side and may just be the naked mole rat's greatest ambassador. People probably wouldn't agree with me, but they're, they're sweet. They're, they're interesting, they're vocal calls, they're chittering, they're chattering, the way they take care of each other. It's all very unique to the animal world, so that's, I love them for that reason. So whether you think the naked mole rat is a beauty or a beast, it could unlock the key to a lot of scientific discovery. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science on CUNY TV. An outbreak of that fearful new virus, COVID-19, also known as coronavirus, started in China, then quickly swept across the globe. Our Adam Miller sat down with a local epidemiologist to learn more about this growing health concern. The virus that causes COVID-19 is still poorly understood. South Korea is one of multiple countries where infections... The novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, a respiratory illness that originated in China in December of 2019, has since spread around the world and continues to make headlines as the evolution of this virus captures the globe's attention. people worldwide. The coronavirus circulating in 2019 and now 2020 is uh, part of a family of viruses um, that range in severity from the common cold to more common more severe um, illnesses like SARS and MERS. 
This outbreak of coronavirus appears to have emerged from uh, bats. Um, it's not clear whether or not the bat directly infected a human or if infected another animal, which in turn infected a human. In fact, almost half of the worst epidemics in recent history were caused by viruses that originated in bats. An epidemic is a situation where the incidence of a particular illness or infection becomes greater than what one would expect. Um, in the case of a novel virus, one case is, is more than what you would expect because it's, it's not something you've seen before. And what differentiates an epidemic from a pandemic is when you have an epidemic situation that is occurring on, uh, across the globe. So not only are we having cases exported from China to different parts of the world, but we begin to see transmission of that virus in other parts of the world as well. It appears to be largely being transmitted person through person to person spread. Uh, that is primarily through droplets, so people are coughing and their, their hands become infected or surfaces become infected and it's possible for other people to pick those droplets up. So the symptoms are um, respiratory symptoms and so cough, fever, um, shortness of breath, and um, it is hard to distinguish between distinguish it from other um, infections that cause respiratory illness. And, and for that reason, the, the, the test, the, the blood test for coronavirus is super important. According to Dr. Nash, washing your hands is one of the best preventative measures you can take. But he also advises that if you think you have symptoms, to seek medical attention immediately. Go to a healthcare provider, get diagnosed or, or get screened. Um, and and um, once you are diagnosed, um, isolation of patients in places where they um, will not be likely to infect others um, is, is critical. Local health authorities are, um, and, and health care providers are trained to do their best and they have clear procedures on how to, to contain. Because this virus is new and never before seen in humans, there is so much we still don't know. And as it continues to spread around the globe, disrupting stock markets, supply chains, and daily life, the big question is how bad will this get, and when will it be over? It's always a question, you know, what's going to happen, and is it, is it something that's going to burn out? Is it something that's going to become endemic? Is it something that's going to, um, you know, continue to, to spread um, to a pandemic level? And um, I, I think, um, we just, it's a, a wait and see scenario. If you look back at what happened with SARS, um, that, that burned out, and I don't think we've seen any cases of SARS around the world since 2004. It's really hard to say. If there is a vaccine, um, we may or may not need it, depending on what, what happens with this particular virus. I think it's important for us to really think carefully and plan um, for pandemics in this country and globally. And so um, this is why we train people in public health. Each time we have an outbreak like uh, coronavirus or SARS or Ebola or MERS, we learn a lot about how to optimize our response for the next event that happens. So as doctors and scientists continue to study this coronavirus, the race is on to learn as much as they can in order to keep us safe. I'm Adam Miller for Simply Science. Peanut allergies are more common today than ever before, but now thanks to a new treatment, allergic reactions could become less severe. Our Mike Gilliam tells us more. The effects of peanut allergy can be deadly. And there are over 1.6 million children and teens in the U.S. who are allergic to peanuts. But there's hope. The new drug is Palforzia, and it's the first FDA-approved therapy for food allergy. It's aimed squarely at children between the ages of 4 and 17 who are allergic to peanuts. Dr. Julie Wang is an allergist and clinical researcher at the Jaffe Food Allergy Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital. This new treatment serves as hopefully an added level of protection against allergic reactions in that by those who are on treatment, if they are accidentally exposed to peanut, hopefully they would either have no allergic reaction or at least milder symptoms than they would have had they not started treatment. 
Palforzia works like other oral immunotherapies. It essentially teaches the immune system to be less reactive to peanut allergens. The same idea is already been used and has been around for over 100 years in that many people get allergy shots. But there is a difference when it comes to palforzia. This new treatment is oral exposures of small amounts of peanut that increases over time on a daily basis to try to teach the immune system to be less reactive to peanuts. It's not a situation where the patient takes one pill and then after a while bumps the dosage up to two and then three pills a day. This is more measured and delivered in a different way. It is going to come in capsular form, but the difference in this treatment is that the patients will not be swallowing the capsules. Instead, each capsule has a specifically measured amount of peanut protein, and families will open up the capsules and use the flour that comes out and mix it with a soft food, such as applesauce or pudding, and have the peanut allergic person eat that. Wang says the first of any dose level would be given under a physician's supervision. And once that is determined to be safe for the patient, they go home and take that same dose for about two weeks before returning to receive a stronger dose of the medication. This would go on until they reached what's called a maintenance dose, which is the equivalent of one peanut. So how long have you been here at Mount Sinai? Dr. Wang was involved in part of the clinical study at Mount Sinai Hospital. She says all the patients were tested for allergies and underwent a food challenge to see how much peanut it took to trigger a reaction before the study. And that study was a randomized placebo-controlled study, meaning that they were randomly assigned to get active or placebo flour. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, to test effect, they under the subjects underwent another food challenge to see whether the amount of peanut needed to trigger an allergic reaction had changed. So if I'm on this medication, does that mean I can go out and have a handful of peanuts? No, it does not. That's a very good question. This is hopefully adding an extra level of protection in addition to maintaining peanut avoidance and being prepared to treat allergic reactions. The peanut allergic individual will still be going out and telling schools, restaurants, and other people that they have the peanut allergy. But this will give them an extra level of protection. This is not intended as a cure, allowing someone to eat a peanut butter sandwich, let's say, nor is it intended to allow someone to have peanut whenever and however they want. The work that was done to develop this medication could help other allergy sufferers too. In fact, Dr. Wang says similar studies are underway right now that could help those who suffer from allergic reactions to soy and shellfish. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. A professor at the Borough of Manhattan Community College is doing research to explore the relationship between perception and brain activity. Here's Ari Goldberg with that story. What happens in human brain when we consciously experience something? It feels like it defines the nature of our existence. Once we fall asleep, in a dreamless sleep, it seems that the world gets turned off for us. When you wake up in the morning, it's like somebody throws you into the world. And somehow our brain generates that world for us. So it's basically asking question of our existence. Professor Marion Pashu from the Borough of Manhattan Community College is trying to read the human brain. Not like in reading your mind sort of way, but by studying brain activity, Dr. Pashu is trying to see if a person can be aware of what they're seeing, whether or not they know they're seeing it. The illusion that we're using in this experiment is called motion-induced blindness. And in that illusion, uh, participants see a bright yellow dot that is constantly present on the monitor. Phys the dot is physically there the entire time. However, the rotating blue masks renders this dot imperceptible. 
So at some points, you might feel like the dot has disappeared of your awareness, even though the dot is physically present on the monitor. And it has been shown that the pupil responds not only to the intensity of light, but also to the perceived brightness. Therefore, we expect the pupil to change size based on what you're consciously perceiving. To put this in context, he explains that in the human eye, the pupil adjusts to the amount of light coming in, getting smaller to let less light in, let's say when it's bright outside, or getting larger to let more light in, like when you dim the lights. Well, perceived intensity is when the eye thinks something is brighter than it actually is. So if you dim a light and there doesn't seem to be much of a change or it appears brighter, that's because your pupils enlarged to let more light in, so it only seems brighter. And then we can take the pupil size as a measure of your conscious experience, independent of your verbal or manual report. I test the project before it gets to run on anybody else. I troubleshoot it to see if it's working smoothly. I also collect the data and, and I analyze and interpret the results that I get from the participants. I want to pursue a career in health research, so this is very exciting to me because the question of consciousness is something that nobody can answer. So the fact that I might be able to help you know, shed some light on it is really exciting. Ideally, we are hoping to discover the brain areas or mechanisms that generate conscious experience. That's one outcome. And the second outcome is we are hoping to then help patients with disorders of consciousness to be able to communicate with us. That will be people who are perhaps in a coma or vegetative state. For these people, we don't know if they have any conscious experience because they have no ways of communicating with us. Our research can potentially give them a way of communication and that way they can tell us directly, hey, I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm Ari Goldberg for Simply Science. A decade ago, our own Barry Mitchell introduced us to Dr. Martin Schreibman of Brooklyn College and his work with aquaculture, which is growing locally sourced fish indoors. Now, a decade later, one of Dr. Schreibman's protégés is taking those ideas from the lab and going commercial in a very big way. A lot of the recirculating systems in this country raise freshwater fish. There are no other facilities in this country that raise uh, saltwater fish on a commercial scale, and there are no other facilities in the world like this that raise bronzino. Eric Pedersen was a Wall Street investment banker who chucked it all to go fishing. I began my career on Wall Street. It really didn't resonate with me after the long haul, and I began thinking about what would combine my interest in fish and in water chemistry and, and in food. And uh, it didn't take long to happen upon recirculating aquaculture, which is what we, we do here in Waterbury. Where Ideal Fish opened for business in 2018. The goal? Raise 350,000 pounds a year of European sea bass, also called bronzino. It's a delicious fish, Barry. It is really one of the most flavorful, uh, popular fish you know, in the Mediterranean. Uh, but as a result, these stocks in the Mediterranean are depleted, and so all the fish that's coming into this country from the Med are farmed. And by the time they hit your plate in this country, they're almost a week old. And some farm fish in ocean cages is exposed to pollution and disease. This type of facility can produce local, sustainable, traceable, antibiotic-free seafood to a consumer that's ravenous for that product. Our biggest customers are obviously in New York and in Boston. We're in all of the boutique food markets. Even if you're a small restaurant just north of Boston, you can order our fish and it will be there within 24 hours of your order. So Barry, the reason you're putting on these booties is that we are a biosecure facility. We don't want to have pathogens brought into the facility that could potentially you know, make the fish sick. Eric, did I mention I'm on a salt-free diet? Well, then you should stay out of this room, Barry, because this is where we make our own seawater that we grow the fish in. We're in Waterbury, Connecticut, nowhere near natural seawater, and yet we're growing an ocean-going fish here. So each one of these bags will make up somewhere around 8,000 gallons of water. Eric sought the advice of experts in starting this unusual venture. One of which was Dr. Martin Schreibman. Macho fish, here guys. Who uh, ran the aquaculture research lab at Brooklyn College for many, many years. Huge pioneer in the industry and a huge influence and, and mentor to me. You want me to put my speedo on? Well, what we have now is the fruition, Martin, of all of your hard work. I am so years. happy to see you. You're a lot grayer than when I first saw you. <laughs> you and I first met exactly 10 years ago at Brooklyn College when you had a prototype, but that was freshwater fish. Those were freshwater fish, it was tilapia, but the idea of growing a sustainable fish product in an area, in an urban area, 
where people demand this fresh quality food, food is, is essential. Throughout their 12 to 14 month life, the pampered Bronzinos graduate through a series of carefully monitored tanks. We actually liken it to a spa. They've got a great life. They do have a great life, except for one very bad day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like to see how we actually recover the fish poo, which is then used to uh, create composted organic fertilizer. So farmers in Connecticut and the New York area can use this product to create a non-petrochemical based source of nutrients for their plants. And the cycle continues. One after the next. Eric, thanks so much for the tour. I have for you this official <laughs> proclamation for renaming Waterbury, Connecticut, Saltwaterbury. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barry. Could you please repeat that? I'm sort of hard of hearing. God help us. Well, that's it for this month's show. Thank you to the CUNY Advanced Science Research Center. As always, you can find us on the web at tv.cuny.edu and on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Andrew Falzone. We'll see you next month on Simply Science.